Well, first of all, Ludwigius Falcher. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome uh, to the uh, 10th meeting of the Justice Subcommittee on Policing of 2018. We have no apologies. Apologies. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the first agenda item is pre-budget scrutiny, uh, and uh, this is an evidence-taking session as part of this year's pre-budget uh, scrutiny session. Our focus will be on the financial aspects of the planned spending by Police Scotland on ICT and on uh, um, spending on policing more generally. And I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and paper two, which is a private paper. And I, I welcome to the meeting uh, James Gray, uh, Chief Financial Officer, and uh, Martin Lowe, Acting Director of ICT in Police Scotland, and um, Kenneth Hogg, Interim Chief Officer of the Police Authority. And thank you for your contributions, as ever, they're uh, very helpful. Now, I understand, Mr Hogg, this is likely to be your last meeting at the subcommittee as you move on from your role, and I'd like to thank you for your uh, work with and assistance to the committee and wish you well in your, in your new post. Um, as I say, the, the, the written submissions are very helpful to, to the, the, the committee. In advance of, of moving straight away to, to questions, I wish to declare an interest. I'm the recipient of a police pension, and it is mentioned in the, the financial uh, statements there. Um, since we're talking about um, ICT, can I just ask in general terms about the lessons learned from the I6 um, project and how they're put into place to shape what we'll go on to discuss, please, if someone can maybe broadly outline that? Uh, Mr Hall. Thank you. The lessons learned from the I6 pro project was one of the questions which the SPA has been asking of the proposals which have been brought forward by Police Scotland now to reform their digital data and ICT capacity. Um, the, there were several lessons learned from the, the I6 programme. One, one, one of those was around the, the risks in a taking a, a big bang approach to change in the ICT area. And therefore, in the proposals that we have now in front of us, and I should say that the the outline business case for the new programme around digital data and ICT was discussed and approved at the SPA board last week. Those proposals, instead of, of a big bang approach, take an incremental phased approach in order to, to, to deliver the benefits sequentially and not put all the eggs in the one basket. There are other differences between the I6 programme and where we are now. <coughs> one of the issues which the SPA has taken interest in has been Police Scotland's own capability to deliver change. And over the last um, year and a half in particular, we are, we are um, content that Police Scotland have significantly increased their change management capacity in order to deliver a, a, a variety of changes. Um, the... The team which um, Martin Lowe leads as director for ICT in Police Scotland is used to running a, a baseline of ICT services for the organisation, but it's not been asked in the past to deliver anything of the scale and complexity as the new programme, and therefore additional support has been brought in. And that, again, is a difference from, from I6. The final point I might just highlight is that I, I6 was an an ICT solution, trying to build on the best of the eight legacy forces and apply that across Scotland. The new proposals instead take a broader approach to, to develop an integrated digital and data and ICT programme together in order to really let policing perform well in the 21st century with 21st century technology. Everything from the way in which officers engage with communities um, the way in which officers engage with each other, <coughs> the way in which they're able to tackle uh, cyber threats, for example. And all of those are, are, are different to what the I6 programme itself would have, would, would, would have delivered. If I may, Stuart, uh, just uh, to follow up um, on, on an aspect that, that you haven't referred to, but it's, it's, it's in um, one of the submissions, and that is about that um, this isn't seeking to uh, implement, I quote here, novel technical solutions. Each of the elements sought in the outline business cases are already in place in one of the other UK forces. If that's the case, is, th is there any danger that there's time, it affects the, the time that that, that uh, um, equipment will have uh, currency? I mean, I, I know you have to go in at some time and there'll always be a new one, but the fact that it's existing use, is that a factor that was factored into your decision-making? 
perhaps I'll make an initial comment of the SPA and then um, perhaps Martin Lowe could comment more from, from a Police Scotland perspective. The, the, the business case does not, again, unlike I6, seek to develop new and untested technology. Instead, though, it would represent a step change from where Scotland's capability currently is to where it needs to be in order to engage in a, a digital world. So it's, it's existing tested technology um, in place in other police forces elsewhere in the UK, but it's not old technology. And what they currently have really is 20th century technology, which dates back to the old legacy forces and suffered from a lack of investment, particularly in the run up towards the creation of Police Scotland in 2013. Thank you. Do you want a brief comment before I bring Mr Stevenson in, Mr Lowe? Yes, please, convener. Thank you. Um, j just in support of what Kenneth has, has said there. So we, we have made that point, that nothing that we're looking to implement is uh, kind of bleeding edge. Um, almost everything that we have included within the ICT strategy is already uh, being used either within the wider public sector or somewhere within um, kind of UK um, law enforcement. There's not a single force in the UK that, that has done everything that we're proposing to do, but everything we're proposing to do has probably been done within one of the remaining 42 uh, 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 forces. Uh, and, and again, just to support what, what Kenneth has said, I think that statement is in terms of general principles around technology sets. Um, of course, you're correct, convener, technology will move on. So we're looking to, to implement mobility for police officers. Most other forces in the UK have already implemented that, but the technology is moving in terms of the types of devices and the approaches. So it's more a general principle. But we believe that that gives uh, an element of confidence and mitigates some of the risk around these 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 types of programmes on the basis that you know the, the technology has been implemented and we are more than keen uh, and willing uh, to learn the lessons from other from others that have gone before us, so to speak. Okay, thank you very much, I've Stuart, and then Daniel. Um, in your introductory remarks, Mr Hogg, you made clear we have an ICT project, but that it's running in parallel with a project that uh, changes the way in which Police Scotland works and the people who are employed there. In other words, it's about changing processes for human beings and so on and so forth. Um, I'm relatively clear who's in charge of the ICT project, who's in charge of the project of uh, change that relates to it insofar as it affects people in Police Scotland and the structures therein. Yes, yeah, so the, the short answer to that question is, is the Chief Constable um, and beneath him the Deputy Chief Officer um, with, with support of his executive team colleagues. Um, perhaps I could just, just um, set the context for this. In 2017, uh, a 10-year policing strategy was, was agreed for Police Scotland called Serving a Changing Scotland. And you're quite right to point out that part of the ICT um, improvements required are not only to upgrade outdated core ICT capability for, 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 for officers and police staff, but also to enable a far wider set of reforms and changes within policing, and therefore to act as that key enabler of change, um, we, need, we need these ICT developments. That is being developed as a portfolio of change. It's managed within Police Scotland in the first instance, reporting to a change board that has been, cha has been chaired until recently by Deputy Chief Officer David Page. It's now chaired by Deputy, Deputy, excuse me, Deputy Chief Constable Fiona Taylor. Um, so within Police Scotland, those <laughs> are the organisational arrangements for leading that. Let me, let me just intervene. Yeah. Clearly, the Chief Constable is responsible for everything. That's a given. And you've referred to Fiona Taylor, who's appeared in front of this committee, etc., etc. Who gets fired if this part of what's done is not done? Because it's clearly not the Chief Constable. It probably isn't Fiona Taylor. Who gets fired? In other words, at the end of the day, if it doesn't rest at a single desk, it will not get done, is my attitude. <coughs> who gets fired? If you're referring specifically to the IC, excuse me, the digital data and ICT program, no, I am not because I think Mr. Lowe okay. is the person who gets fired on that. But you've this. <laughs> do do forgive me, Mr. Lowe. I hope and believe that's a distant prospect. 
it, it, <laughs> but sorry, to be serious, yes. and the, I'm trying to pursue quite a serious yeah. point, that ICT projects can succeed as ICT projects, but the project as a whole can fail if the organisation doesn't respond to yeah. that changed ICT environment. And because the benefits are delivered in what people do, not by the ICT system. And I just want to be clear who we as a committee and everyone else should hold accountable as the single person whose job it is to drive through that change. Because this ain't easy, and I want to know who it is functionally, not the name of the individual necessarily. So accepting that the Chief Constable does delegate, yes. um, but within, within, within his structure, the, the individual who is leading that wider programme of change is Assistant Chief Constable Angela McLaren, and she's supported by our uh, business change manager in that. And she's, she's doing that in the role as chair of that board that you referred to? Uh, the, chair of the, the chair of the change board is DCC Fiona Taylor, but she has specific responsibility for that, for that broader programme of cultural change, which you're referring to, to support the ICT right. change. I don't want to spend more time on it, convener, but I think that's been a good start. Thanks. I, and I'm sure there's collective responsibility for driving it forward. And for the avoidance of doubt, we're wanting everyone to maintain their positions and work industriously in the public's behalf. Yeah. Uh, Daniel, thank you. Uh, so, Mr. Hogg, you set out the, 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 the identification of the fact that you're relatively happy that, that Police Scotland has, has taken on board new ca capacity and capability around the technology space. But obviously, this is a very big programme. There's going to be need to be resource which is needed for the programme, but then not needed thereafter. Therefore, you know, there will be third parties contracted to deliver this programme. I, I was just wondering if you could, or, or, or whether it's yourself, uh, Mr. Lowe, Mr. Gray, could outline how that is going to be approached. Uh, are, are, is there going to be work packages put out for tender to uh, you know, specific systems integration firms? Uh, also, how do we ensure that, that, that there's not sort of mission creep? I know Ernst & Young are already engaged. Is there a broad approach in terms of engaging third party uh, to deliver this work and, and, in ter and also the, sort of the commercial structures that will sit around that? Oh, I'll, I'll answer that, convener, if that's, if that's okay. Um, th thanks for the question. Yes, I mean, we we've talked about the uplift in the existing Police Scotland change um, kind of cap capacity and capability, but we already recognise that, that that won't be sufficient to deliver on, uh, the, the, as you've already suggested, a programme of this scale. So there will be a need for uh, some commercial engagement. Um, we're, we're, we, we've, we've done some uh, pre-procurement market uh, engagement. Uh, there are some options that we are currently working through in terms of how that looks. As you'll probably gather, there are a number of different options that we could uh, look to explore in terms of a, a, a single vendor that could uh, partner with us to help deliver this uh, programme. Uh, we could um, divide that up. You've already identified uh, the kind of systems integration partner will be key. We will definitely need that type of uh, support. So, so the options that are available to us in terms of how that looks and feels are currently being worked through. The, the, the fact that the, the overall OBC was approved uh, last week uh, by the SPA uh, and is now being submitted for consideration at government level, we're not, we're not sitting on that waiting for the answer. There is further work that we're doing um, on, on the support of this programme, and that includes the, kind of the, the make-up and shape of the commercial engagement. So it's right to Sorry. Briefly, um, it's, it's very challenging but for anyone listening in on the, the uh, OBC, if we can just... Sorry, sorry, sorry the, 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 the shorthand. Yeah. We, we all do it, Mr Lowe, if you could just maybe yeah. outline yeah. that term. The, sorry, out, the outline business case. Yeah. Well, I was about to ask when you were about to issue RFPs, but I, I won't do that. Um, <laughs> uh, what I would be interested, you know, given, I think, that the structure, um, you know, how those work packages are put together and... and you know, how they, they uh, are also fit with one another is obviously a critical point. You've got your outbound business case. What's the timeline for actually you know, putting work out, out to tender or, or indeed actually even identifying how many work packages there will be within the, the overall programme um, of the three, which is £300 million, as I understand? Um, so so some, some of that convener will be subject to clearly uh, the... Um, 
decisions that, that have yet to be made on funding, so there is an element of, of this that will be based on that, but I would expect they would be fairly well advanced in terms of our, our plans and model before, uh, before we get to the tail end of the year. And, and, and will we, I mean, obviously there'll be commercial sensitivities, but yep. there's obviously a, a deep interest that, that, that what will be one of the UK's largest IT programmes uh, is rolled out effectively. I mean, what, what level of insight will you be able to provide us so that we have confidence that that, that is progressing as we would expect? Um, I, I, if, 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 if there's a wish on, on the part of the committee for us to, to, to come back and share uh, some of that, then, then I'm, I'm perfectly happy to do that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Before bringing Liam in, um, Mr Hogg, um, what scrutiny of third-party contracts will the SPA do, uh, particularly with regard to below the threshold of 500,000, which we've talked about in recent times, please? The process from now on is that um, before contracts are entered into, individual full business cases will be developed for each of the component parts of this going forward in line with the available funding. Um, once the Scottish Government has considered that and once this Parliament um, approves a budget for, for next year. So those individual components, and this picks up um, Mr Johnson's point, those, those, those individual components will, will come forward separately for scrutiny and consideration by the SPA before the, before the contracts are, are let. Um, on your comment about the the thresholds, the thresholds do remain in place. Um, however, the SPA is taking a range, has taken a range of action in order to um, assure itself about the robustness of this work. So some of that it takes at its own hand through officers and members' engagement with Police Scotland. Some of it is instead is about ensuring that Police Scotland's own systems of, of assurance are up to scratch and are working appropriately. And some of it, alternatively, is about engaging third parties and getting third party scrutiny around this. So, for example, as part of the, the testing the quality of the outlined business case, our internal auditors, Scott Moncrief, were asked to review whether or not the outline business case was fully compliant with the Treasury Green Book guidance, which is part of the Scottish Public Finance Manual. Um, and their conclusion was that it did materially comply with that. And in addition, we had a Scottish Government-led technical review conducted of the proposals as well, and they gave a red, amber, green um, rating to the programme. At this point in time, they rated it amber, green, for example. So through a range of activities, we will be um, looking, for, um, looking for detail and testing what comes forward, but it will be at an individual component level in addition to the global outline business case. Okay, thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, Liam. Good afternoon. Um, just following up the point you were making earlier on, Mr Hogg, about um, learning the lessons from I6, the, 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 um, the move away from a, a big bang uh, approach, but uh, more of an integration with digital and, and, and strategy around data, it would suggest that there are more components to this, and therefore it would be interesting to understand whether the approach then to, to governance and to, to uh, assurance has changed as a result, and in what way has it changed, both within SPA and what you're looking for in terms of the challenge function and the oversight within Police Scotland? Yes, this is a more complex and a more broad-ranging set of proposals than I6 was. It, it has, a, has a far wider scope in terms of aspirations and in terms of its, its, its impact on, on, on capability. The, for the SPA's part, um, that's very much something which we're actively considering at the moment. Um, in particular for this reform programme, but actually more generally, because we are at the moment seeing a ramping up of the policing reform activity in other areas as well, in, in order to, to deliver the 10-year policing strategy. Another area, for example, would be the corporate services transformation, which is also, which is also coming down, down the tracks at, at around the same time. So um, you may know that the SPA has um, commissioned a, 
or is undertaking a review of our own corporate governance structures in this area. We're looking at our committee structures and reviewing whether they are um, optimal for dealing with a change programme of this size and scale. And the digital data ICT programme is one very good example of where both at board level and committee level, but also in terms of the SPA's executive team's capability, whether we do have in place the, the, the capability that we need to apply, well, to fill our statutory functions in the governance of, in the, excuse me, the governance and scrutiny of these proposals. About the, the capability, is that in terms of, of, of capacity or in terms of understanding or a combination of, of, of both? In terms of the SPA's executive team, it's a combination of both. So what that looks like in practice is recruiting additional people with, with, with additional skills. And that's something that we are partway along the journey of. Uh, my own assessment as interim chief officer has been that the SPA executive team has not been um, at the level of capacity cap capability which it needs in order to carry out our core statutory functions. And that's what led to the improvement plan which we put in place um, at the start of this financial year and which we've been working towards delivering against since then and against which I then report to the SPE board monthly and in more detail quarterly. And in terms of the, the, the Police Scotland um, uh, governance arrangements and management of this process, I mean, presumably, Mr Lowe, you're taking the, the lead there, but, but there will be strands of this for which there will be, there will be project leads. How, how is, again, the governance and the, and the assurance um, secured o over what will be such a broad-ranging um, set, of, uh, set of proposals? So, thank you. So, Convener, the first, the first point I'd probably like to make is that, and, and again, this points to one of the differences between this programme and I-6. So, so, so this transformation is being led by senior police officers, supported closely uh, by senior police staff, um, uh, uh, professional kind of advisors like myself. Um, so I think that's an important point. So we, we have SROs, um, senior responsible officers, convener, uh, for uh, all, of, <laughs> all of the individual constituent uh, projects. We have our uh, internal Police Scotland governance around the Corporate Finance and Investment Board, the Change Board, as you've, as you've heard. Um, we're also establishing some additional elements of, of governance and assurance. Um, so uh, there's, there's work being done at the moment to stand up a design authority, which is going to be essential given the, the component nature of elements of the, of the programme. Uh, and sitting uh, underneath the design authority is going to be a technical design authority that I will lead that will ensure that the uh, kind of questions around the individual technology components uh, are being meshed together in a way that uh, is, is sensible. So that there's a whole range of existing governance and new elements of governance that, that has been put together to support this programme. So that, that I mean, you, you probably touched on it earlier on, but that process of, uh, of, of what this is going to, to look like has identified solutions that are already in place and operational in, in, in other parts of the, the UK. Um, and therefore, there, there isn't going to be a kind of test in the market to see what they come back with um, and, and, and suggest that they can they can they can do within a within an assigned budget. This is this is going to be far more sort of prescriptive and driven from from within Police Scotland. Is that right? Well, there, there will still be a, a testing the market uh, clearly because there will be uh, kind of open you know uh, procurement uh, around those types of technologies. So I, I'm not sure if that's if that's the point that you're making, but there will still be that. So your expectation would be this is this is the baseline. If anybody thinks that um, what they're able to do can can go beyond that, it's up to them to make that to make that case. We'll, we'll be very clear within the individual projects what 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 the business requirement and the technical requirement is. Um, so we're still going to we're still going to engage with the market, uh, even though we've got good information and awareness and knowledge of existing solutions that are out there. I, I see that as a I see that as a benefit. The government's governance and insur assurance processes internally within Police Scotland will be able to challenge anything that comes that comes back um, in, in a robust fashion. Absolutely, there will still be that full um, um, assessment of um, submissions from vendors in, a, in, in the normal manner from a procurement perspective. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Rona? Thank you, Convener. Uh, good afternoon, panel. Um, <clears throat> could I ask you to perhaps outline your priorities for this IT 
uh, ICT project, you know, your sort of top line, and also how much um, of an input do trade unions and staff associations actually have in, in leading those priorities? Whoever, Convener, yeah. I can, I can, yeah, I can take that. Um, so, so um, and I think I probably referred to this uh, last time I was here. So in, in terms of the priorities, um, fr from a technology point of view, but, but more important from hopefully an operational uh, policing perspective, um, we've talked about I6. I6 didn't deliver uh, the, the gap and the requirement uh, uh, for the, the type of capability that I6 uh, would have delivered still exists. Uh, so there is a, 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 a project as part of the programme around core operational policing systems. So that, that would be, in my opinion, one of the key priorities. Uh, I think we've been fairly clear that um, provision of mobility uh, and providing mobile access to officers uh, remains uh, a key priority. Um, I think I, I mentioned last time data and tackling the challenges that we have organisationally around data. Um, uh, uh, that is uh, no small challenge, and I think we need to uh, rationalise and consolidate our data sets and data flows. So th th there are three uh, that I would immediately mention. Um, there are some core infrastructure elements that are in very much in my own uh, uh, domain uh, that, that we need to um, develop. Uh, and so, in, in other words, technologies that will underpin everything that we're looking to do. So, for example, uh, refreshing the network, making sure we've got the right level of connectivity and bandwidth uh, to all of the uh, uh, locations that we have throughout the country uh, is essential. Uh, so that would be another another priority uh, that, that I would put in, almost describing that as a kind of um, a, a, a foundation or a building block or a pillar or, or you know, that, that type of thing. So those are, those are the priorities. Um, in terms of the, the unions and the staff associations, um, so again, from, from my own um, perspective, um, my, my reading of the, of the situation is that the unions and the staff associations are um, broadly supportive of what we're trying to do from uh, within the, the, the data, digital and ICT strategy. Um, they, I think, understand and agree with the need to provide uh, better technology uh, solutions to uh, both our officers uh, and our staff. Um, th there's been consultation uh, with the unions and the staff associations, um, although I would probably say that we, we can always do more uh, in that space. Um, I've presented um, several times now to uh, the Police Scotland bi-monthly kind of engagement forum to which all the unions and staff associations uh, are uh, invited. Uh, we've had discussions with the, the Federation. The Federation were able to um, provide some of the storyboarding and some of the officer case examples uh, for inclusion uh, within the uh, OBC and clearly like many of you, no doubt, I follow the social media um, contributions from certain members of the Federation, and I think recent uh, recent uh, tweets and, and so forth have, have indicated that they are broadly supportive of the, the direction of travel. I'm, I'm sure they're supportive, but I mean, have they actively been asked for input and been putting forward suggestions to you? Y yeah. Yes, convener, yes, they, 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 they have. Um, and around two of the, the pieces of work that I highlighted as a priority, the core operational systems and the mobility uh, project, I'm aware that the Federation are actually involved on the decision-making bodies of those uh, projects, so that they're there within boards or steering groups uh, actively contributing to and influencing the, the, the direction of travel. I think that's a good, um, a good baseline or a benchmark for how we uh, involve associations uh, and unions in uh, the, the, you know, the, the projects that will be stood up as part of this programme. Is there any one aspect um, so far of the strategy that's proving to be problematic or the toughest challenge you know, for you to face? I think, thank you for that. The, the biggest challenge will be uh, securing the funding that we need to deliver the programme. OK, thank you. <clears throat> uh, thanks, Rona. Mr Lowe, can, can I ask you um, about a submission we have from Unison here, uh, um, where they say, and, and I quote, we do, however, have concerns that there is a tendency in Police Scotland to fetishise I hope I've pronounced that correct, the cutting edge of technology at the expense of the assistance which would enable the organisation to function. Do, do you know what's behind that comment? I know I would ordinarily direct it to the source, but 
Do you recognise the sentiment or do you understand what prompts a comment of that nature? Th thanks, Convener. Um, in short, no. Um, so we've already, we've already discussed that the technology that we're looking to implement um, as part of this programme is, 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 is pretty much tried and tested uh, within most other uh, public sector bodies or, 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 or UK uh, uh, law enforcement agencies. Um, so, so, no, I don't, I don't, I don't particularly uh, uh, recognise it. Um, I know there's some reference to uh, drones, convener. Um, I, I don't know if you want me to, to touch on that, but I don't. Uh, this is not about um, technology that is not proven uh, and, and, and space age kind of solutions. It is about fundamental, basic uh, technology uh, uh, for frontline operational policing. Okay, thank you, Liam, and then Stuart. Thanks, Kevin. I'm just going to follow that up. Mr Lowe, you've, you've referred to, to part of what I think Unison were driving at, but to sort of complete the quote, it was, we need investment in a strategy for improvement which does not prioritise drones or retinal ID tech at the uh, expense of getting the basic ICT infrastructure right. This is long overdue. I mean, I, I take it you can offer some reassurance that that is what lies at the heart of this process. Uh, uh, absolutely. So the, the, the vast majority of the uh, constituent projects, the funding that we're, we're, we're seeking uh, uh, to get is around uh, core technology aimed at um, core operational policing. Um, to my knowledge, uh, and there, there has been some discussion around um, uh, retinal kind of uh, uh, systems, etc. But there's there's no there's not a project within Police Scotland from a technology point of view that I'm aware of at the moment that has been stood up to look at that. Uh, the organisation uh, is uh, and has uh, purchased uh, uh, UAVs, uh, drones uh, under another another guise. Uh, they're not they're not operational. They're they're currently being uh, uh, tested. Mr. Hogg, I don't know whether there's, there's anybody who fetishises. Uh... <laughs> IT in, in SPA, but perhaps you could reassure us of that. Um, the related point that I wanted to uh, touch on was this point about um, actually priorities and why we're doing this in the first place. And from the SPA's perspective, one of our absolute priorities is that whatever's done in this space delivers the, the actual benefits for frontline officers and staff. And in plain English, what that has to mean is that officers are, are not still using pens and paper in taking notes and then going back to an office and typing something up and typing it up several times on several different systems and therefore not being able to spend more time in communities. That would be one of the benefits that we are really keen to see delivered by this. And I think that sort of sits beneath the jargon of mobility or mobile working. There are some really basic things which both staff associations and trade unions are, are very clear need to be fixed just to get to a basic level of um, functionality. Long before we ever get to some of the higher end cyber crime capability stuff, which is also part of this mix. So, it's that, it's that focus on benefits, which is one of the tests which the, the SPA has been and will be applying to this as it progresses. Are we convinced that this is going to deliver the very real world changes which are, are necessary and which are currently frustrating officers and staff in Police Scotland from doing their jobs properly? Thanks, uh, I wonder if Unison were, were on something quite important. Um, fetishization, etc. Um, is the software that we're looking at software that we expect to migrate over time over a range of hardware platforms? Because it's the bigger investment, because it relates to how people do the job, and changing people is more difficult than changing hardware. Now, I ask this because I've just discovered in the last two months a bit of software I wrote in 1974 is still running. So, you know, it, it, and, and indeed, a pal of mine wrote uh, the first algorithm for printing in Braille, and it's still in use, and he wrote it in 1969. So is that, I think, you know, Unison are raising a very important point there. Is the software going to have a longer life than the hardware may, and is that part of the plan? Um, th thanks for the question. 
I think as I think as Mr. Hogg's already suggested, um, that you, you know the, the software will be modern. Um, it will be of its time and current. Um, but, but as I guess you already know, uh, uh, Mr. Stevenson, software and hardware um, uh, platforms uh, need to be, uh, you know, refreshed, patched, upgraded uh, over over time, uh, and, and you know that just goes with the territory, I guess. Um, I, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but the, the, both the hardware platforms, the the, the 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 hosting platforms, and the, the software will be will be current. Thank you. Uh, we will be coming with some specific financial questions, Mr Gray. I'm conscious you're sitting there patiently. Thank you. Um, Fulton. Yeah, just a couple of quick questions. Thanks, Convener. Um, following on from Rona Mackay's line of question, um, the rollout of the technology, will it be Scotland-wide altogether, uh, or will it be division by division? I can answer that, um, uh, or, or at least attempt to answer it. It will... It will the deployment model, the implementation model, will, I guess, be determined by the nature and the specifics of the project. So in, in some cases, so the answer is both. In some cases, there may well be a deployment uh, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a project where that does happen on a divisional uh, level, and some of it may well occur at a kind of a national level. Um, just depends on the nature of the, of the project. So again, if I give you some, some examples, um, the the mobile working project that uh, that uh, we're looking to stand up, um, that will be trialled uh, initially in one division. Um, we'll, we'll 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 seek to get the learning from that and the lessons from that, the officer feedback from uh, the deployment, the training, the implementation, the early uh, look and feel of that solution. Uh, we'll use that information to shape. Uh, the rest of the, the 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 project, which will likely to be uh, on a on a divisional level. Yeah, so you, you actually answered my what would have been my supplementary there about how you could learn if it if it wasn't uh, one initial rollout. Could you just comment uh, briefly on the the nature of the information that will be placed in the public domain um, um, in terms of updates uh, during further planning and implementation? Okay. Um, as you, as you would expect, uh, we will be, um, as we do at the, at the moment, we will be um, publishing regular updates on, on our progress. We will be reporting those to uh, various levels of existing uh, SPA governance. Um, and by definition, those, those, uh, those uh, reports tend to be uh, uh, placed within the, the, public, uh, the, the, the public domain. Um, I think you'll find already that a high degree of, hopefully, um, transparency around the core documentation on this on this programme so far, um, the strategic outline business case, the strategy, some of the supporting documents, the covering papers, have all been uh, placed within uh, the SPA uh, uh, public domain and are therefore available uh, on, uh, on on their website. So updates are likely to include expenditure updates, uh, results of testing and risk plans. Like I see, I see, Mr. Hogg looking to come in, but absolutely, in, in my opinion, yes. It was just, it was just, to, just to confirm that the SPA's intention would very much to be do what it did last week, which was consider the whole outline business case um, in public and to and to publish the papers associated with that. There was one exception to that. The only item which the SPA took as a private item of business was an annex to that outline business case which dealt with counter-terrorism and serious organised crime matters which was classified confidential. Everything else was, was, was discussed in public and going forward uh, would and should, and should be. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Margaret. Yeah. Good afternoon, gentlemen. I wonder if you could provide an explanation of what has caused the increase in, in costs from the previously reported figure of 200 million to now 298 million. So in the um, strategic outline business case that was um, produced a number of months ago, that looked at a cost profile over a five-year period. Uh, since then, when we've worked the numbers through on the outline business case um, that was approved at the SPA board last week, that's now been stretched out to be done over a 10-year period. Um, so the, the numbers from a, from a capital um, requirement perspective haven't changed significantly over that first five-year period, but what we've built in 
on years six to ten is, is the replacement costs um, that would be required, and that, that's um, the reason for the increase. Be more specific, replacement costs? For the ICT in particular. Sorry, yes, for ICT hardware, um, and, and, and it's something we we have done within Police Scotland every year. As IT hardware um, it reaches its its end of life, it gets replaced. So it's building in a replacement program for for, for ICT hardware. Yeah. So it's a ninety eight million. All of that. Does that count for the the total increase of the ninety eight million? So. In, in um, <coughs> the the outline business case, the the capital requirement over ten years is um, 244 million pounds. So the difference in capital in, in the previous strategic outline business case, which was 206 million, and, and the outline business case that was produced um, um, for this month of 244, the difference between that is the, the replacement costs in years six to 10 for hardware. Is there any revenue costs? There are revenue costs, and that's uh, the figure you were quoting of, of around three hundred million pounds. That's taking the capital costs of two hundred and forty-four, and the reform, the revenue um, expenditure associated um, with the outline business case, um, which is largely um, linked to the um, corporate services transformation um, part of of the, the digital data and ICT business case. Um, as a result of that being a cloud-based solution, which is, is a revenue-based uh, model, as a, whereas most of the other is, is, is capital. So that's, that's the, the revenue element, the, the investment part of, of, of the revenue, uh, revenue element is, is £53.8 million pounds over the 10-year over the period. Are there any costs associated with the use of consultants? There are, um, and they are both included within the, the revenue costs um, related to having a, a, a um, professional service support for the corporate services transformation, but also built into the capital costs um, for, the, for the rest of the, the DDICT um, um, outline business case. Those numbers aren't in the actual um, the 200-page document, which I think you've been sent, but I, I can give you, if, if you would find that helpful, a breakdown of how much um, we're estimating the professional services component would be for each of the different packages of work that, that make up the, the overall um, programme. I think we would most certainly want to see that, and especially in light of the submission that we've had from the Scottish Institute of Policing Research, where it says it's important to learn lessons from the failure of I6. As plans are made and budgets are um, allocated, it's essential that value, the value of our academic researchers rather than just private consultants are harnessed. Also, in unison, there's obviously discontent when they say some of the costs um, we've seen um, in the budget has been spent on internal, con uh, external consultants and constructors. So I really would, um, I, I think the whole committee would like to see much more detail on how much has been spent. And can you say why? You, you haven't looked at the Institute of Policing Research and that academic um, expertise that's there? So, um, with regard to the, the professional services spend, we will absolutely um, share with you what we have at the moment. But, but bearing in mind, this is still an outline business case and, and it's our best estimate. What, and as, as the accountable officer said earlier on, um, will happen is there'll be a number of full business cases that come through for each of the different components which will have the actual costs in them. So we can share it, but just to say at this moment, it, it is based on estimates. Um, and the reason for having um, the, the professional services um, cost built in, that, um, in, in the outline business cases is linked to the point raised earlier around it's bringing in surge capacity. They're not people that we need to have employed permanently because this is coming in, doing a piece of work, and then and then those people moving out. So that's that's why it's been it's been done in that way to enhance, as as was said earlier on, we have strengthened the internal capability to deliver within Police Scotland, but it's not enough, and and that's why there is professional services in there. So can you tell us even a ballpark figure of what's been spent on external and um, consultants to date. To, to date, um, well, I, I can say what the figure has been um, in the first five years of Police Scotland, so from 2013-14 um, through to the end of 2017-18, of um, it's £11.3 million. Pounds. And the proposed um, expenditure in the current financial year is, is £7.7 .7 million. Pounds. So th there has been a, a fairly significant uplift this year, and, and that would um, continue 
in, in the next number of years if we were to progress with digital data and ICT, because just the scale of the programme um, means that, that there isn't sufficient um, capacity within the organisation to do it and, and the expertise required. And also, we wouldn't want to employ people full time and, and make it, you know, have a, have a commitment um, f to a full time em employee where, where it's a, it's a time limited piece of work. And, and, and that's why there are um, professional services costs within the, the business case. Uh, Sky I6 um, costs were um, reimbursed. That's correct. Were the costs reimbursed for the consultancies? fees? To the best of my knowledge, yes, but I, I will confirm that to you. Yeah. And the, the point from Dr Megan O'Neill, Associate Director of SIPR, the Institute of Policing Research? Yes, I can, I can respond to that. Um, the, the SPA uh, does have uh, good links with, the, with SIPR, and indeed I met with the, the Director uh, recently, as indeed separately did the Chair of the SPA, um, SIPR is a, comprises a, a network of 14 academic institutions and they carry out extremely valuable research on all matters relating to policing. It is different though from the sort of technical support which, we ha which is being brought in to Police Scotland to deliver the Digital Data ICT programme. In that case, the support being brought in is people who have worked with other police forces in the past to build similar digital data ICT systems within police forces. It's, it's more at that, at that applied end. Um, could I also just clarify that I think the figures which um, James Gray quoted apply to professional services for all purposes, not just digital data <coughs> ICT over the last five years. The actual sum spent on, on, on the ICT component will be very, very much smaller than that. Um, there was like in a broader range. General point about the use of, but specifically with the ICT, you mentioned that um, further financial teams and backup additional support had been brought in. Quite a lot of additional support, I presume, that's to deliver the ICT as long as uh, as well as general things. Can you tell us the cost of that and outline just how? how much um, support that is. The new Chief Financial Officer, I take it that's yourself, Mr Gray, um, a team of seven strategic leads and management. That's quite some investment. Can you quantify just exactly how much has been spent in that in addition to the consultants? Specifically in relation to the, the finance service or, or, or do you the mean team, more? The new team that's <coughs> been brought in to... Um, to deliver, take the lead in finance, and that would include delivering the ICT, the overall. Okay, so um, the, the the seven new leads brought in to, to strengthen the finance service is was part of a restructuring of of the senior team um, within the finance in Police Scotland. So it it will help support the digital data and ICT, but it was it was more broad than that. It was to support the whole financial management, financial planning. Um, the seven posts, um, to the best of my knowledge, and I, I can check, are, is an investment of approximately four hundred thousand pounds per year. Um, what I would say is that there has been a a, um, a a restructure. So whilst those seven posts have that value, that there, there have been people who have left the organisation. So there's been a saving there. Um, and as, mem as uh, you know, as, uh, as you'll be aware, previously um, we had brought in quite a bit of additional support from professional services to bolster the finance function, um, and, and, and that's now tailing off um, and has been replaced with a, a new um, senior team. As part of corporate services transformation, um, which is, is, is in, included within digital data and ICT, there will be a, a restructure of the entire finance service. Um, we have made progress in that we've got a new senior team in place. We've been working through a payroll project. Um, so what I can say is it's my, my objective that the overall cost of the finance service of Police Scotland will be less um, than it was two years ago, but will be of the sufficient quality and to address um, the issues that have been raised previously by Audit Scotland and, and internal auditors. So, for example, the payroll project will deliver recurring service or ongoing annual savings equivalent to nearly £1 million, which more than pays for the additional um, senior people that I brought into the team. And, and the reason I did that was for an organisation with a budget of, of, of £1.1 billion. I, I had two 
um, direct reports to, to, to manage that entire budget, and, and it was just completely unmanageable. So that's why it's been strengthened out to have the seven. Um, I think we've got far more um, control around around the finances now. There's still a lot of work to be done, but I would hope that um, as you know, future audit reports come out, there will be value demonstrated in, in that investment. Well, you understand we're doing our pre-budget scrutiny just now. We're looking at things like staff costs, and I would have thought, as the um, new chief um, finance officer, you would understand the value of the, the committee having these figures before us today, um, both the consultants, the cost of the new structure, and um, I, I'm a bit concerned that the... Uh, the offer from the Institute of Police Research, because <coughs> lessons are learned, and, and we've already said from other public sector projects, is uh, it seems to me being dismissed. And it's going to come, if there is value there, a fraction of the cost of some of these other services. I merely, merely leave that thought with you and look forward to the additional information you've undertaken to provide. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, thank you. Uh, Stuart. Uh, I just wanted to, to briefly explore uh, in the ICT project uh, where costs go, revenue versus um, capital, and in particular in relation to the software. Uh, we've heard that uh, a lot of the software is coming from other police forces in these islands. <coughs> Who owns the intellectual property associated with the software that will be brought? And therefore, based on that, how are you allocating that to revenue or capital? OK, thanks. Thanks for the question, convener. Um, so, so just to clarify, the, the software that we're looking to use will not be coming from other police forces. It is being used in other police forces, but these will be commercially available software products uh, from commercial vendors and suppliers. Um, so you will have no ownership, you will merely be licensed to use it? There, there will be a range of licensing, licensing options, as again, you, you'll be aware around yeah. perpetual licensing or, 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 or whatever the models are, you'll be aware there are a number of models for software licensing that vendors um, uh, offer. So how, how are you going to treat that uh, allocation to revenue or capital? Uh, there's always a debate when it's a perpetual license as to which side of the line you put that, yeah. for example. Yeah. So. Um, I mean, I'll maybe ask James to come in a second, but within within those profiles around capital and reform, um, there is a there is a, um, a provision within the capital for software that would be being um, purchased almost in, a, in that perpetual way, and there's a smaller uh, a smaller uh, set of provision within the revenue for licensing that would be uh, kind of renewable, um, depending on the model. Sorry. I'll uh, let me just deal with Mr Lowe for a minute. Uh, if most of the software is therefore going to be licensed, uh, are you making arrangements to escrow all the materials that would be necessary for someone else to take over the maintenance of that software in the event of default of the supplier? Thanks. Yeah, yeah so, so escrow provision would be a standard, a standard um, uh, provision within our tender documents and the contract um, uh, documentation. That's fine. I think Mr Gray wanted to supplement. It was just to, to give you a, a, a bit more um, background to how we've developed the financial model um, in, in, in the outline business case and how we've got this, the split between capital reform and, and indeed revenue costs. So we are saying that um, by the time, um, it, you know, if, if, if all of this programme is fully delivered, then there will be revenue costs, recurring revenue costs of, of about £28 million um, per annum in there. But obviously significantly more more benefits um, nearly 53 million but um, what we have done is we've looked and and, and it, is, it is an area of judgment and you're right it can be quite tricky around what could be treated as, as capital as an intangible asset and wherever we, we could do that that's what we've 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 tried to do on the basis um, that uh, we know we've got some significant um, revenue challenges um, in, in the years ahead but certainly we, what we've done is we've applied Accounting standards about what's reform, uh, sorry, what's what's capital and, and what's revenue, and and built the business case on on, on that basis. So that's why we've got an, an element of investment that's capital, an element that's revenue, and then obviously the ongoing revenue costs that are associated with licences and maintenance. What different depreciation uh, uh, figures are you using for software that you're capitalising on hardware? 
So um, we typically use five years. That's a piece of work where um, we would we would need to do some some more detailed work on that because w the way we've captured the investment requirement is to say well the capital requirement is 244 million that's the cost obviously there is then the the non cash depreciation element that feeds through the budget but um, a working assumption is five years but we need to get into more detail behind that because obviously different types of hardware may, may be able to have different lives but that that's our standard accounting policy. Convener. Thank you, sure. uh, Daniel. I just wanted to ask a, a brief supplementary on Margaret's final question and, and, and briefly something on Fulton's. First of all, just in terms of the outlined business case, that's obviously an estimate, as you, as you stated. Uh, an estimate at this stage must involve quite large uh, estimating factors and margins for error. Is the number that we've got in front of us, is that your expected uh, cost or is it your maximum at cost? And what degree of, of contingency factor has been applied uh, to, to, to the, the, the outlined business case? Uh, no, that's a, that's a, a good question, and, and we have considered that. So, um, what I can say is, for each of the different modules within the outline business case, there has been optimism bias um, has been considered f for all of it. Um, the optimism bias ranges from zero percent, where we have certainty over cost. So, for example, mobile working um, is 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 a, is a component of the digital data and ICT outline business case. But is actually is, is in itself being a full business case that's moving ahead, and we have a contract, so we know what what the actual value is, ranging through to some of the modules where you, where you're right. We, 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 there's you know a lot more um, clarity required to get certainty over the cost, so we've applied up to 50% optimism bias on the cost there. The, the average across the the outline business case is 20%, um, which for, for for outline business cases is. is is fairly common, um, but it, that's the average across across the piece. So our expectation is that um, the, the costs overall will, will not exceed what's what's in the outline business case. I, I, mean, I was just wondering maybe if there was any more detail that you might be able to share with that um, uh, following this meeting. Uh, and I've got the second question really is for, for, for Martin Lowe around uh, kind of the, 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 the milestones and level of information you might be able to provide. I mean, I think last time around when we were discussing this, I had some concern that the information we had was very technical and technology driven. And my view is that any programme like this needs strong functional uh, design and also a strong outline application architecture. <laughs> Uh, is that maybe some information that you will be able to uh, both uh, publish or share with the committee once those become uh, uh, available? Thanks. In fact, some of that was already available. So uh, there is a um, project roadmap that is, that is available as part of the products that, that I mentioned earlier. There is also a, a reference architecture, so the technical reference architecture. Um, that, that at the highest level is a, is a relatively straightforward model with an awful lot of detail sitting uh, underneath it. That, that, that material is already available uh, also uh, in the public domain, um, but happy to uh, pr provide uh, you know, that information to committee if, if it's necessary. Thank you, Daniel. C can I ask, um, and, and I'm hoping all our last hour or so hasn't been academic, what discussions have there been with the Scottish <laughs> Government ministers or officials regarding the funding of this, please, Mr. Hogg. I can respond to that. We, um, the SPA, for its part, has um, certainly discussed the ongoing development of the work towards the outline business case with Scottish Government officials. Um, I've also been present at um, a briefing meeting with the Cabinet Secretary for Justice to um, brief him on the expected um, outline business case costs. The, um, that was, that, that there was, was in advance of the um, SPA board meeting last week where it, where it approved the, the outline business case. If I may, could I make one other related point, um, which I think just very briefly. Y yes, indeed, but um, so Cabinet Secretary said no problem, 300 million. Certainly not. No. <laughs> the, the Cabinet Secretary thanked us for the briefing and said he would need to consider that as part of the government's um, ongoing spending review. And, and that really does relate to the extra point I wanted to make. One of, the, one of the things which, one of the questions that I've asked as accountable officer is, well, what's the cost of doing nothing then? If we don't do this, what, what would the cost be? And that, and, that, and that working was built into outline business case. 
And the answer that the Earthling business case produced was that over the same nine-year period, nine, ten-year period, as the 244 million capital cost is, is cited for the preferred option, the cost of simply maintaining the existing systems and not adding any additional functionality or any modernisation is over 95 million pounds. And I think that's important context, and it's, and it's a point that I've also made to the Scottish Government. You know, we really don't have any of, us an op any of us an option to do nothing about this. The level of functionality is not acceptable in policing. The key question is what should be done. And we are, compl you know, that, that needs to be a conversation with government. And in the event that, in the event that the full capital or indeed revenue funding is not available from government to fund this, the intention would be to phase this. It would be to, pr to progress towards the same, the same goals set by the outline business case, the same option which performed best in terms of value for money, but simply take longer to get there and to cut our cloth accordingly in, in line with the available funding. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, Margaret? Yes, it was to follow up on Daniel Johnson's point about contingency funding. Um, I see it, uh, we've got a submission from Police Scotland and I see in, um, in their figures on that table from from 2018-19 onwards, exactly the same figures are in um, in three in three columns. Now, how does that um, how does that tally with the the 20% optimist bias contingency? It's exactly the same figures from 2018 to 2056. So, which? Could I ask which page of the submission? It's page three, table two, one, two. Okay, so this this table um, is actually unrelated to digital data and ICT. This was to demonstrate that um, in the um, financial memorandum um, that was um, associated with the the bill um, for for police Scotland, police Scotland coming into being had um, a an assumption that £1.1 billion worth of cumulative savings would be achieved um, up to 2025-2026. And what this table um, sought to demonstrate was that, based on the actual cost savings that have been made um, in the first five years of Police Scotland, excluding the reform funding that has been provided, so you, if you net that off the reform funding that has been provided, then. Um, the cumulative savings will be um, in the region of £1.852 uh, billion, pounds, so rounded to £1.9 billion. And it was just to provide a bit of context around, um, it was my understanding was this session was, as well as digital data and ICT, it was looking at the, the wider finance aspects, and it was just to highlight that um, since Police Scotland has come into being, it has um, delivered savings um, that on an annualised basis now um, are almost £200 million pounds a year. Um, and um, cumulatively up to 2025-2026, um, that will be £1.9 billion against a, a target of 1.1. So it was just to demonstrate that there has been significant savings achieved and, and that the organisation is on course to exceed um, the original savings target in, in the business case. We're still considerably in deficit. Could you tell us um, where the savings have come from, the £200 million of costs from the annual cost base? There's been um, significant savings in police staff um, headcount. So, um, in total, uh, and I can get these figures verified, between packages that have been paid to people, like voluntary redundancy, voluntary early retirement, and also deletion of posts, um, it's, it's getting on close to 2,000 um, posts. And in addition to that, when you look at the non-pay budgets, there's been a significant reduction in the number of buildings um, that, that Police Scotland has, and there's been significant estate savings um, coming out of that, um, as well as just general efficiencies. When you look at, whilst the, the number of police officers has been retained, um, that there have been reviews into the the, the, uh, the rank ratio, so the, the kind of promoted um, structures, and there has been a, a rationalisation of, of senior posts. So obviously, an example being, instead of eight chief constables, there is one, but obviously that's filtered down through through um, all, all ranks. So that, that's how the, the savings um, have been achieved. And going on to make these um, cumulative efficiency savings, would that be the same areas? But 
So, so the way in which um, the 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 1.1 billion pounds of savings had to be achieved was it was it, it's cumulative in the sense that because you, you, this 200 million pounds of cost being taken out this year, you, you count it every year through until you get to, get to the end. So it's that's not um, that 1.852 um, uh, billion of cumulative savings is something that's just rolling forward the level of savings that have, have been achieved to date. That, that, that's the, the basis of the calculation. Well, there, can I put to you what the SPA have said in their um, submission? It's proving increasingly challenging to support the ongoing requirements of a national service which must maintain a physical estate, fleet vehicles, ICT and other nation, national operational equipment at this level of expenditure. And that's protected to go on to make this one bill say, and savings. So where are these additional savings going to come from? Because it sounds as though it's totally unsustainable that we close more police stations while the physical estate is still needing um, to be upgraded when vehicles are needing replaced. So, so um, the, the, the table that we were previously speaking to is in, in regard to savings coming out of the revenue budget. And, and your point is right that I think I've, I've put in, um, in, the, in the Police Scotland submission on, on page four that we are operating at a revenue deficit at the moment. So we have budgeted to, to have an operating deficit of £35.6 million this year, which is down from an underlying revenue deficit of £63 million in 1617. But we're on track to get that to zero by 2020-2021. But what we require in order to achieve that is, is, is the um, investment in, in reform that we set out in our three-year financial plan. But you make a really, really good point in, in relation to that table on page 10, if that's the one I'm picking up correctly. That's, that's um, in, in relation to our capital in, investment. And we um, currently have a, a capital grant um, this year of £23 million. Um, that's supplemented by receipts from disposal of buildings. So the, the single largest one this year is Pitt Street in Glasgow. And as you can imagine, in the early years of Police Scotland, we, we, we've had significant disposals of property and we've been able to use the, the sales receipts to supplement our capital plan. But we've now got to a point where there's very few future large sales coming through. So we'll not be able to supplement our capital plan with a significant level of receipts. So, for example, our capital plan this year has £14 million worth of um, asset disposals to support the spend. We, we, we're talking in future years of two to three million. So if we were to retain a capital grant at the level of 23 million pounds that we've had in the past, then that will not be sufficient in order to, to maintain. And not, not, I'm not talking about enhancement. I'm talking about maintaining the existing asset base, which we have. And we know we've got backlog maintenance issues, but then everybody does in their estate, uh, but also the, the age profile of the fleet. So there'll be a, a significant uh, reduction um, and, and the quality of the asset base, if, if £23 million was, was to be what continues into the future. And that's before you talk, talk about you know, the investment here of digital data and ICT, which is a significant uplift on that, because um, the, the figures we're talking about here is just to, to maintain what we have. Um, and, and £23 million isn't, is, 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 is very small. And, and, and I think the reason behind it, to, uh, to be honest, is that Police Scotland in the early years weren't particularly good at developing business cases to make a compelling case for capital investment. And this is an example where you've seen digital data and ICT, where we've come forward for this is how we fix that part of the organisation, and that's the bill. We haven't done it for other areas yet. Could I just interrupt you there? Um, yeah. Capital? physical estate um, comes into that, replacement of vehicles, capital, they both have revenue costs as well. So one way or another, whether we're looking at the capital budget or the revenue budget, um, if this is the area where we're targeting, there's going to be significant expenditure needed in the next few years. And I don't see this recognised in, in the projections. So our, our three-year financial plan does recognise the, the, the revenue costs associated with our, with our asset base. And, and one of the points that we've made is actually, if, if there isn't sufficient funding in the estate or in the fleet, then you see that the costs, we get cost pressures coming through on our revenue budgets. For example, the fleet um, tell us to maintain, stand still on, on the existing three and a half, roughly three and a half thousand vehicles. They need 11 and a half million pounds a year. We spend fi we're spending five and a half million pounds this year. That causes a revenue pressure because the age profile increases. So the maintenance costs of the fleet on average go up. So you're quite correct that with an absence of investment in, in the capital um, estate, that it puts a, a pressure, a cost pressure into our revenue. 
Thank you. Hey, Daniel. So, uh, I'm just coming on that very point. So in a recent discussion I was having with uh, some local federation reps, they raised the very point about vehicle maintenance budgets, and they were pointing out that, that, that uh, or they were suggesting, rather, that local divisions were having to use their budgets to prop up uh, the, the maintenance of the vehicles just in order to maintain a sufficient uh, number of vehicles uh, for, for them to do their local policing duties. Is that a picture you recognise? Is, is that sort of uh, flexing manipulation of local division budgets to, to supplement the, 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 you were pointing out, is it five and a half million compared to the 11 million that ought to be going into to maintenance? Is, is that a picture you recognise? Um, it's not a picture that I would recognise that um, a, a local division would be able to use some of its budget to buy a vehicle because actually the capital purchases is all controlled centrally um, by, the, by the fleet department. Local divisions do have an element of flexibility in their revenue budgets that if they were had had sufficient budget, they may be able to look to do something with vehicles. But I, I, I don't know the, the detail of that. I would have to look into the specific... The suggestion that was made to me wasn't that they were buying new vehicles, rather that they were they were m maintaining older vehicles beyond their their kind of expected service life, because the, the the you know essentially what was coming from the central pot was both in terms of the, the number of the vehicles wasn't there, and, and and frankly they were just having to patch up, make do, and mend using their local budgets to do that. They also said to me, and I, and I quote, that if you went into any police yard, you'd find uh, vehicles that weren't able to move because of a lack of uh, money being spent on them. Uh, is that something that you'd recognise? It's not. Uh, no, it's not something that I would recognise at, at a local um, division level. I do recognise that nationally, across across the, when you look at the maintenance costs of fleet, that we are seeing cost pressures coming through because of an ageing fleet. How many, how many vehicles, or what proportion of vehicles, are you know at any given time unable to be used because of uh, lack of maintenance? I, I don't have um, that information, but I could. Um, would you be able get to provide that? Yeah. Um, I mean, just I mean, just quoting your own submission. Uh, you know, given the sizing uh, of Police Scotland and our asset base, this level of uh, funding results in underinvestment that's not sustainable. So even if my characterisation there is not one that you immediately recognise, it does seem to suggest that there is a, a current and and uh, immediate impact just because of the the state of your your physical estate, vehicles, you know, other physical assets. I mean, what is the the current cost? or, or uh, hindrance that the current capital uh, levels are, are imposing on the police force today? Again, the, the, the detailed work uh, it, around that has been done. I don't have it to my hand, but I could uh, have it to hand, but I could, could provide that. Um, but the, the point I was making in there, I mean, for example, it, and, and it does go back to Police Scotland hasn't made a particularly strong case in the past for, well, we need a new estate that's more cost efficient and all the rest of it. And, and there is an estate strategy on its way. So we're, we're conscious of the fact that we need to start developing this and coming forward with robust business cases to seek the funding. Um, without us coming forward with business cases, then we, we won't receive it. But just to say, give you a bit of context of where we are now, our current capital <laughs> grant is £23 million this year for the National Police Service. If that was to uh, that run rate continued over the next five years, then our capital programme would be smaller than that of the Shetland Islands Council, based on their published capital plan for the next five years. That's a useful benchmark. Thank you, <laughs> Mr. Hogg. Yes. It, it was just to add to that point. I'm, I'm conscious that the context for this discussion is pre-budget scrutiny, and um, as a county kind of officer coming into this organisation, I have reviewed the overall financial structures. Uh, structure of, of policing in Scotland. And I just wanted to um, endorse the point that the Chief Financial Officer made about the size of the capital budget. For an organisation spending £1.1 billion, pounds, and for an organisation of the character of policing, which does use equipment and cars, that I, th I do think there's a particular issue about the size of the capital budget and the balance between the revenue and the capital budget. £23 million pounds is a disproportionately small capital budget for a public service of this type and, and of this size. And almost irrespective of what we do with, with, with digital data ICT, I do think, um, well, I'd be very grateful if the, if, if the subcommittee would consider that point in making representations about the policing budget, because it does have far more systemic consequences, which members have picked up about impact on revenue, for example. 
Thank you. I assure you, Mr Hall, that will be reflected in our representations. Um, Liam, you were wishing in, and I'm conscious of time. Yeah, thanks. Uh, can we, uh, for the avoidance of doubt, let's, let's make clear that Shetland Islands Council doesn't have um, a, a, an excessive or exorbitant capital budget. I was just wondering whether um, I, I, I feel honour-bound honour to say that um, on behalf of my Shetland colleague. Uh, in terms of the, the representations that you've made, uh, Mr Hogg, to the, to the government, you set out the, the do-nothing cost in relation to, to, to ICT or data, digital I, and, and ICT. Have you mapped out the, 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 the cost of continuing along the line, as, as Mr Gray said, of a, of a capital budget of, in the region of £23 million and the implications uh, of what that will be for, this, for, for the, uh, the fabric of that estate, but also the, the, the revenue cost pressures that Mr Gray said are as a result of, of not having adequate maintenance in, in a number of areas? And are you able to kind of quantify yeah. what, that, what that looks like? Only to an extent. Earlier this year, the Scottish Police, Scottish Police Authority um, approved a, a three-year financial plan for the first time for Police Scotland, which underpinned the three-year implementation plan, along with a 10-year financial strategy for Police Scotland. Now, those documents did, did profile cap capital expenditure going forwards, and so I have a reasonable degree of confidence and certainty about the next three-year period, including the current year as year one. And for example, we are on track halfway through the three-year period to eliminate our deficit on schedule by 2021. And to go back to an earlier comment about the investment in the finance team, I think that I think that the proof of the pudding is in the eating and the fact that we are we have now got a grip of, of, of the finances and we are on track to return to financial balance on, on track is a positive thing. But what I've not done is undertake, undertaken a specific capital forward look along the lines that I think you're suggesting, which would project out what would the practical consequences be beyond that three-year period, for example, years four to, four to ten, of a capital budget of this size over time. Yep. Just one final question. Has any uh, assessment uh, been done about the risk of a, a pension shortfall, police pension shortfall? Um, I might make a brief comment and then maybe invite James to comment. The, the, although the pension costs appear in the annual accounts for the Scottish Police Authority, the financial risk for police pensions is borne by the Scottish Government. So um, that's why, although there is an overall pensions deficit mentioned in the accounts, it is nevertheless accepted to be um, a going concern because it's underwritten by Scottish Government. Um, but I don't know whether you've got more detail on that. No, I mean, that, that, that is the position. I think that the, the point that we maybe raised in the submission was just that um, what we're, we're finding is that there is a significant pressure on the, the, the justice budget, as you'll be aware of, of police pensions. It has, has been growing and, and, and um, that has indirect consequences, I suppose, for the, the public bodies within, within the portfolio and that if more money goes into pensions, then there's a less available to be distributed to, to, the, to the public bodies. That was the only point that I was making on that. Well, I suppose you would want us to be asking the Cabinet Secretary about that when he came in. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Can I ask... Um, Anyone any other? No, that. A final a question, and, and, and it's about a, a recurring issue that we've, we've, we've come over, and it is the, the tension, if you like, between the um, additional 1,000 officers, this figure, 17234, the implications that had for the loss of valued police staff who were, who were laid off, the issue around backfilling, and then something that uh, is, is more recent, and that comes from the, the, um, the draft three-year financial plan from the 2nd of May, which talks about uh, capacity creation, which we're told would result in a reduction of 300 officers. So we understandably have unison concerned about the first one of these um, and the continuing implications of it, and the Scottish Police Federation understandably concerned about the latter. What discussions or how will the budget reflect uh, the, these competing demands? Perhaps I could um, start off on that, on that question. First of all, in terms of police staff, it's undoubtedly the case that in terms of which staff group um, bore the brunt of the cost savings in the early years of Police Scotland's life, it was police staff and not police officers. And there are, um, as uh, James Gray mentioned earlier, 
up to 2,000 fewer roles in police staff now than there were at the time of, of Police Scotland's creation. Partly that's been driven through efficiency, and, um, and that's a good thing, but nevertheless it is the case that there are particular concerns there. Linked to that, um, and it's a point that I know Unison have made in their submission to the subcommittee, there has been an ongoing inequity about some of the legacy terms and conditions of service of those police staff, depending on which legacy force they served in. Um, they are now paid differential rates for doing the same job. And therefore, one of the priorities has been to harmonise those terms and conditions of service. There has been a, a, a programme of work going on now for um, some years, but which is culminating this month, um, hopefully with um, positive progress being made towards a final proposition being made to all members of staff, which would see a harmonisation of those terms and conditions of service. The costs of that have also been built into our, 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 our budget planning going, going, going forward. On your question about police officers, the the three-year plan, um, year two of that, which is next financial year, does include an assumption of a, of, of a reduction of 300 officers in the total complement in order to deliver the financial savings outlined. Um, that was part of the three-year plan, and it's um, it and Police Scotland, Police Scotland are currently taking action towards that. Those assumptions can be revisited and can be changed, but if that, if that were the case, other offsetting savings would have to be found in order to maintain the positive progress towards the balancing the books by 2021. No, it's, it's, uh, I suspect this is just how I heard that, Mr Hall, but there's no suggestion of revisiting the very good news that terms and conditions of police staff are being harmonised. That's not what you're talking about revisiting. You were talking about revisiting the officer numbers, police officer Sorry, numbers. Sorry, yes, there's, there's absolutely no intention to, to revisit the harmonisation of, of terms and conditions for police staff. And all I'm pointing out is that in the three-year plan for police officers, there is an assumption that in, in 2019-20, there will be a reduction in, in, in total of 300 officers. OK, thank you. We, we had a, a, a session about firearms licensing, which was very helpful, and uh, there was a lot of concerns about that particular issue there, where police officers had been replacing um, uh, police support staff previously. And uh, at the conclusion of that, we got a, a very reassuring breakdown of figures. Would it be possible to get, and accepting that you maybe won't, there will be areas of uh, confidentiality around some of the, the departments. Would it be possible to get a, a layout of establishments, both police and support staff, and a comparator of how that would have started at the beginning of Police Scotland, please? Because I think that would be helpful. Certainly. OK, there being no further questions, can I thank you very much indeed for your, your contributions today. That's been extremely helpful and informed not just the, uh, the, this committee, but also the, the Justice Committee, which is, is scrutinising the legislation and will be uh, meeting with the Cabinet Secretary in the coming weeks. So thank you very much indeed. I now close this. Um, All right, I beg your pardon. Thank you very much. Um, yes, uh, I beg your pardon, we're not closing the meeting. We are, uh, the next item on the agenda is to agree to take future consideration of the draft report and pre-budget scrutiny and our consideration of the work programme in private. Uh, are we agreed to that? Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I, I now can close the meeting uh, and thank you.